Right. Just so we so get no text, no more text messages from my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> she, it's, her, it's her birthday today. Oh. oh. I have. Uh, I'll tell you part of my story at the end. Stacy and Jerry already know it, but we have to make sacrifices when in the family, right, mm -hmm. to do the Lord's work. So the Lord said, this is important to be at the March for Life, and it's important to be here today. But if somebody, if don't stop shining your lights, but if you would turn the light out in the back, mm -hmm. I want you to be able to see this. If somebody could turn the light out in the back. Can everybody see it? Okay. Um, because the visual on this is going to be important is that um, this is on predatory relationships, sex trafficking, pregnancy, and forced abortion. And to tell you a little bit of the ministry that I'm doing now is it's called Speak Hope, and it's bringing hope, healing, and transforming care uh, to those held captive both inside and outside the womb. We give hope, we speak light, we reach with love till every captive heart is set free inside and outside the womb. And it's based on Psalm 34 verses 4 and 5. Those who look to him will be radiant with joy, no shadow of shame will darken their face. And Job 5.16. So the helpless have hope, and injustice shuts its mouth. Mm -hmm. And um, you know what I found is that I have been working in the pro-life movement for over 30 years. I'm a woman that has abortion in my past. I've gone through much healing, and the Lord has taken me on a journey. But He was showing me there's a part of our culture that we're missing, and part of that is is because we may have gotten stuck in a rut. We have maybe, even if we're in pro-life leadership, we may have even thought that that's a job. You know, we've built up and lost our heart for a mission to see abortion and the ending of uh, the shedding of innocent blood. So the Lord was asking me to check my heart. And where was I? Because he was seeing things that I was not seeing. And he was hearing cries that I was not hearing. And so he's very clear about that. I think it's in Psalm 13 and Psalm 18 of how long, how long, how long, O oh Lord, and the injustice not only of abortion, but the injustice of human slavery, which is called human trafficking, and is often considered to be a buzzword. You know, there will be, I say this very lovingly, but there are some people that may want to get involved in ending trafficking but not in ending the shedding of innocent blood. Because we can all see when we start talking about abortion, people get triggered either in a good way or in a not good way. And a lot of that is because of wounds that are in their heart, like me as a woman who has abortion in, in their past. But I also, in reflection, saw that I had uh, been exposed to predatory relationships and other at-risk behavior that uh, I was right on the brink of being trafficked myself. Mm -hmm. And that's why I believe that the Lord has brought me into this to set the captives free, but to hear the cries of the broken, to see with His eyes, and to love those that have been discounted and their voices have been silenced. You know, as I sat down uh, stairs, I had been ministering in a pro-life community for 30 years or so. And it wasn't until I was invited to go down on Bourbon Street and see with the eyes of Jesus and start going into the strip clubs. And uh, I knew that it was a spiritual battle that we're in and that prayer is a key. Because I can tell, I can tell you the enemy doesn't play fair. <laughs> and uh, we need to make sure that we're fully armored with the armor of God when we go into these places. Prayer and fasting is a key. And to really ask the Lord to see with his eyes and his heart. And that's one thing that I believe that the trafficking movements that are out there, they're not fully do doing yet. And, um, but the Lord is moving us in the pro-life community into this through these types of, of trainings. So um, what I saw was there were many young women that were in these clubs and they were pregnant. And they would let the girls dance until five or six months pregnant because it is perverted and evil. 
there's even more money paid to have sex with a young woman who's pregnant. Oh. And as one of the survivors, uh, Brooke Bellow and Marlene Carson have said, is that it's because, <coughs> it's, it's just, I'm not going to go into all the evil, but it's evil. So that child in the womb is being raped also, literally. Even though the child's still in the amniotic sac, it's just that spiritual realm of what's going on. So the Lord was asking me to enter into this through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I knew it because I could feel God's grace on me, and I can still feel His grace on me. That He's calling us, I believe, as the last day's church, and warriors, especially in the pro-life movement, to go into some of the darkest places and to be His light. And he, to follow Him into those places. So this is one of the things. There's a whole industry. It's uh, through cartels, uh, mafia, uh, gang-related. There's more money that's made by selling a human being over and over and over again than it is by selling drugs. So how do they do this? They're targeting and grooming a generation through social media, through fatherlessness, through uh, the uh, abdicating of roles of parents by distractions with jobs. And so a young woman's heart is really looking for affirmation from her father. And she may often feel abandoned. So enter another young man or a, a man who's older than her. And he may be called a Romeo. I'll move that up there. But he may be called a Romeo. And what that Romeo does is romances her. Tells her all the things that a woman's heart may want to know. I'll take care of you. Your family doesn't understand you. You're not alone. You're so beautiful. And they target young women who may be in foster care, uh, through so social media, single homes. But they also do that with two-parent families. And even in Christian youth groups. Mm. So one of the things that they do is it's using emotional manipulation, control, intimidation, and abuse, coercion, deceptive force, offering gifts of drugs, mixing drinks with drugs, kidnapping, brutality, and violence. Uh, it's sort of incremental how that goes. It's mind manipulation and brainwashing. So you might ask, well, if she's out there on the street and she sees a policeman, why isn't she asking for help? Because she's been so brainwashed and so beaten down. You know, it's, it's sort of similar to why would a woman who's in, being battered in domestic violence stay with her batterer? And it's similar to the Stockholm Syndrome. It's what happens to the mind and the soul. So what happens, it can be the first person can be a Romeo, and he's the one that maybe she hasn't met yet, maybe on social media, or she has met that person. And he gives her attention, manipulates, alienates her from friends and her support group. And then the next person that steps in, say maybe she's going, she goes out on a date, or um, she is, um, sometimes, a Romeo who never meets the young woman will then set an appointment to meet her and that's when the gorilla steps in and that's the brute. And the brute will kidnap her, take her through brutality, violence, and drugs. <coughs> also, if that young woman has run away from home, generally within 48 to 72 hours, they say, she will be kidnapped by a trafficker. But my experience has been it's within 24 hours. Wow. Because if those girls are running truant from the schools, there are traffickers or recruiters that are going through the neighborhoods and looking for the girls that are out in the streets. And so the reason why, because it's a billion dollar industry. You know, so when someone like me comes and wants to help, um, and I'm not doing it directed by the Lord, I may have you know, a good heart to do it, but I'm not being equipped or sent by the Lord, it can become dangerous. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why what I want to give to you is just some tools, but then also encourage you, <coughs> as you become aware, to contact law enforcement that is highly skilled and trained. Most law enforcement agencies have had multiple trainings on trafficking, but we still need to pray for them because sometimes there's corruption within the law enforcement agencies, other times they see so much that um, they become war-weary in the battle. 
of, of the evil of the day. Traffickers target victims, children aging out of foster care, online, including social networking, Facebook, uh, uh, you know, Instagram, TikTok, uh, other, other ways of building relationship without even the parents knowing. Mm -hmm. Because um, they're, uh, they've been, become skilled, traffickers have been skilled, become skilled in doing this, and parents may abdicate or abandon that child, and you, know, you can not monitoring the social media. So uh, high school and college, unsuspecting, uh, they enter into controlling relationships. I started doing this portion of ministry on trafficking when one of my daughters was going away out of state to school, and she would listen to me, and very good, she's the one that texted me, and uh, she uh, would say, but you know, Mom, I'm aware this is not going to happen to me, mm -hmm. until one day the Lord woke me up to pray for her, mm -hmm. and she had gone to a target in the community where she was, and she identified that she was being recru recruited to be trafficked. She said, Mom, I knew that I knew something was wrong because I didn't have any makeup on that day. <laughs> and my face was all broken out, and he was telling me all the things. You're so beautiful. Why don't you come outside? So she was able to go ahead and report this person to the target manager. And so that's one of the key things. She could have chosen to say, uh, that's not true, what I've learned, that's that's not happening. Or, just not done anything at all, but she took action, and uh, because of that, that person was addressed, and police and law enforcement came in. So I'm not sure what happened, but always take action, and and don't be concerned. What will people think of me? They would they would rather have law enforcement and these human trafficking hotlines. They would rather have you report. In fact, there's a National Human Trafficking Hotline number that I'll be sharing with you that they translate over 200 languages based in Washington, D.C. Young women are trafficked. They become pregnant. They're forced to have abortions. There was a um, trafficking ring that was recruiting young women as uh, young as 14, even younger than that. But they were trafficked from Mexico to Florida through Texas, Louisiana, the Gulf Coast, along the I-10 corridor. And that's where I live. The Kramers who are here today, they served in New Orleans. They came to New Orleans a few months before Katrina, and then they had the opportunity to, <coughs> to minister through Katrina and Hurricane Katrina. And what we saw down there was things changed, and there were a lot of people moving in and out and in and out, mm -hmm. and, ac and across the border. But I know I didn't know how to identify then. I saw women coming into our pregnancy center beaten up. They were from Central America or Mexico. And they didn't have identification. And I now know most likely those women were being trafficked. Sex trafficked. One was forced to have sex with as many as 130 clients per week. Mm. Average is about 25 to 30 uh, clients having sex 25 to 30 times a day with different <sighs> men. Okay. Oh my goodness, now we're going on the Fox News. So, um, they were beaten and forced to have abortions, and the cost of which was added to their own debt. So, what they were, what happened was they had become these young women had become pregnant. Then they were forced to have an abortion, and they had to pay off a debt when they came to America, and the cost of their abortion was added to it, and they had to pay for it. Okay. The victims may be allowed to have one baby. Uh, that's an anchor baby. That will anchor that woman to her pimp or, tra or trafficker. The victims may be forced to have, abort subsequent children, and as Dr. Let Laura Letterer's research showed one of the women said that she has as many as 17 abortions that she could remember. Mm -hmm. The victim is told if she does not abort, she will be killed. And so, um, and I've had more than one young woman tell me that, listen, I was told I would be killed if I didn't have the abortion, so what was I supposed to do? So she has not only the trauma of being sold into slavery and being forced to have sex, 
but then she also has the trauma, which we know is post-abortion trauma, of repeated abortions being forced to kill her child. So there's a great need for healing, uh, a healing community, and I've found that the greatest healing has come through the healing of the Holy Spirit. Because he will go into deep layers where no man or no woman can go. Mm -hmm. And it's often through worship. It is very likely that a victim of trafficking who seeks help has already been a victim of abortion multiple times, as I said. Okay, this U.S. study by Dr. Laura Latterer that I referred to, she's with Global Centurion based in Virginia. And she's actually uh, participating in the March for Life tomorrow with us. Um, forced abortion was common amongst victims. 55% of sex trafficking victims surveyed reported undergoing at least one abortion while trafficked. 30% of sex trafficking victims surveyed reported multiple abortions. When Dr. Letterer was doing this survey, she was doing it for the health needs of trafficking victims. She inadvertently found the research of the uh, increase of abortion and multiple abortions and pregnancy. They had no idea of how severe an epidemic it was because the pro-abortion community like Planned Parenthood and uh, the traffickers, they are forcing the girls to have abortions and then they're hiding the abortions, which we've seen on some of the live action videos and some of the other undercover videos that the truth about uh, what the abortion industry is doing with trafficking victims is just uh, coming out. It's just coming out. And that's why we want to be a part of healing uh, those women that have survived trafficking so that their voices can also be heard, not only by the church, but by the government. So how do we know? Some of the identifying things are, you see that young woman on the right, top right, she was branded, she was tattooed. Mm -hmm. They actually put that mark on the girls, whether it's mm -hmm. on their head, sometimes on the forehead. Sometimes they will go ahead and put a tattoo with the trafficker's name on there, mm -hmm. branding her so that other traffickers know she's in my brothel. Not in yours, she's in mine. The girls will have to sometimes, if they're with the trafficker, they walk with their, or, or they're out on the street. They may have their heads down because if they look the, another pimp in the eyes, that means that they belong to that pimp. <clears throat> and they're, they are uh, so beaten down. And they can even be sold from brothel to brothel to brothel. We uh, started an alliance called the Life Freedom Alliance, and it's Alveda King, Dr. Letterer, and myself, and to give help and hope to the uh, women who have been discounted and forced into having abortions and uh, <coughs> violence during pregnancy so their voices could go ahead and speak. There's, I'm going to be handing you out information. There's a little video on there that it's actually the voices of survivors that have gone through not only trafficking, but forced abortion. And what they talked about was the tattoos, addictions to drugs and alcohol, uh, identity as a human being is stolen, the victims are mentally programmed by the trafficker not to trust police or those who can help them. That's why they may be arrested and rearrested and rearrested, and the police want to help them, but they're taught that the police are the enemy. And up until a few years ago, the police were not fully aware of this, so they were just seeing that woman as a prostitute that was coming in over and over again, including the health community. The women were going into the emergency room for uh, sexually transmitted diseases or just violence that was happening to them, and the health community was not identifying them. They were coming in, and then they were sending them right back out to their pen. So we've been able to go ahead and train some of the health community also. And here's some of the statistics identified in trafficking survivors. 71% have said they were pregnant. 67% had STDs. 55% one or more abortions. And 55% had miscarriage. And usually that's through violence. Mm -hmm. they, they were beaten, so, so severely beaten. Um, one of the survivors, she had um, been forced to have three abortions and the damage that was done to her was uh, caused a hysterectomy. 
she is now married. Uh, she's in full-time ministry. But she, I was in a meeting with her, and she really cried out because it has hurt her heart so much that she's not been able to have a child with her husband mm -hmm. because of what happened in the past. Okay, and again, victim contact with health, health provider. Um, any health care provided, 88%. Um, and these were, what they were saying is this is the a contact that they had with the health care providers, but these health care providers were not getting help for them. They were not able to identify them. So almost 88% that had health care provided said nobody identified us as, mm -hmm. as being trafficked. And then you see Planned Parenthood on there also. When Dr. Lederer was doing the survey, she did not really understand what Planned Parenthood's part was in providing abortions uh, for trafficking victims. And she's talking about now going back and doing a more investigative survey uh, with, uh, with more survivors to get a fuller picture. And then where abortions were performed in the clinic, and most of those were in a Planned Parenthood facility. Mm -hmm. Hospital was 16%, and other was almost 14%. And this, this is just one of the survey sheets. It's sort of hard to see, but you can see all of the things that they uh, circle, health issues while trafficked. And there is um, on there bipolar, uh, you know, all uh, abortions on there, PTSD, uh, all sorts of trauma, arthritis, you know, there, there's different things that, uh, that they were trying to address on there, but over and over again, abortion was circled on this questionnaire. And then the other questionnaire also, and you can see the things that were, were on there, and um, she, you know, if the doctor was able to identify, and they said no. And then on this one, you can see, here, how many abortions, let's see, how many abortions did you have? She had 17. Oh. That she could remember. Because the trauma is so great. This is a young woman that is on the faces of prostitution. These were her mic shots wow. that was trafficked. You can see her. The first one is when she was first arrested. And there were some that were in between. The last one was the last time that she was arrested. Wow. And she's, she's dead. Oh. Her parents were Same. not able to, her family was not able to identify her. Oh. And this is common. What you're Ooh. seeing here is common. You see the beatings. And usually the one down here where she has sort of the black eye and her hair is cut off, that's usually a sign of punishment. Mm -hmm. That she's done something that it can be something very little and for the pimp to be able to keep control. Okay, so how can you tell? And these are trafficking posters that we pay for with our tax dollars. And um, uh, they're available on our website, speakhope.net. There's a resource tab on there that will take you directly to those uh, posters and resources that are free of charge that you can place in your parish, in your church, in your ministry, and also, like I said, there is a uh, helpline, a hotline, that translates in over 200 languages. And so it could be, these are just some of the signs. Held against their will, unable to move or speak freely. They may not have, they may be in, from another country and not have an ID. Um, it's usually someone who's, uh, you know, you can tell there's something that's just not right. I know in New Orleans, we would see maybe an older man with a 13 or 14 year old girl and just little signs like stilettos or there was just something odd on a truck stop. That would, we have truck stops, you know, all over the nation, but especially where there are a lot of highways around, um, there's a, an organization called Truckers Against Trafficking that has been able to help law enforcement identify young girls that are being trafficked at truck stops, with truckers also. They can pose as a boyfriend, family member, an employer, or a friend, or possibly even another client. I was speaking with somebody downstairs and they said, it was an attorney, and he said, you know, I was contacted recently uh, by a pregnancy center and they said that they uh, had a client that 
was a prostitute and she was going to be bringing in three of her friends. And to me, that would be a red line, a red flag, that that is probably what's called a bottom girl or a manager in the brothel, and she's bringing in three of the girls from the brothel that are being trafficked. So um, when I first started learning all of this, I thought, oh, this is too much mm. to learn. But that's why I want to encourage you, you can go ahead and look at our speakhope.net website. It says resources on there, and there's a lot of links for information, including continued online, links to continued online training on there. Okay. Victims may seem very scripted, inconsistent or vague. They may not admit that they are victims. They may resist and rebel against you because they've been told that you're the enemy. Or they know that if they even go get help, that they've been told they will be killed. Or if they have an anchor baby, that their baby's going to be killed, or their family's going to be killed. They may call the trafficker daddy, boyfriend, or baby. If told by the trafficker, if you don't have an abortion, it's your life, that will be taken, your life or the baby. That was actually a quote from one of the young women that um, is now uh, helping others. Uh, they can be, have been told by the trafficker not to trust law enforcement. There's a, a young woman by the name of Teresa Flores, and Teresa lives in uh, Ohio. And she was uh, trafficked out of school, out of high school. She went to a Catholic school, and she had good parents, but her, and her parents told her, we're not going to have you date until you're around 16 years old. And so, uh, and we want to meet any boy that is going to take you out. Well, Teresa was approached for about a good five or six months by this senior in her school and he was building a relationship with her and then he asked her if he could take her home one day after five or six months and she heard her mom say in her head we have to meet the guy first the young man first and the first and she said well he's nice so she got in the car with him then they went and they stopped by his house he said would you like to come in for some sprite and she heard her mom, again, her mom and dad say, we want to meet anybody that you're with. And she went against that. She went in. He had Rohypnol, in the date, which is a date rape drug, mm. in the Sprite. And when she woke up from that, she had been raped by his two cousins, and they <coughs> took pictures mm. of the rape. And so he threatened her, her uh, threatened that he would tell he, uh, her parents, her priest, and that he would uh, hurt her little brother and her family if she didn't do what he said. So eventually she got out, but um, they did kill her dog. Oh. So again, it's because it's greed and money. Okay, reaching clients in predatory relationships, uh, what we do is we follow up with client and um, I'm going to just go ahead and we just go ahead and skip this one. This is for well, I'll tell you that you can adapt this. This is what we do with pregnancy centers. And you can, you, I would, if you are in leadership in your church, I would encourage you to do some training with your staff. And again, there are resources online, and I'll give you my email address, um, that you can do just some very basic training. And I have some resources up here also. But you can put posters in your bathrooms on the inside door, just even in uh, the ladies' room. Um, you know, educate your youth about uh, trafficking. Um, and just some very basic things, not to cause fear, but to really make them aware that not everybody that says that they are nice is nice. Mm -hmm. And not everybody that says that they want to be their boyfriend wants to be their boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And so the, this is the Human Trafficking Hotline, which is 888-3737-888. And um, Stace, would you mind handing these out? Okay. And there's, that's it. Just those two. Is that Stacy's going to go ahead and hand out some uh, papers that have that hotline on there as well as some uh, how to identify trafficking victims, because I'm going through this fairly quickly. Uh, but that 888-3737-888 is that way 
because it's easier for a possible a victim of human trafficking to remember those numbers. Mm -hmm. you know, 888 3737 8 I can remember that. And so, um, and you know, if you see anybody that you suspect, you can give them that number, even if they don't speak the language that you do. So, and they, again, that is the human trafficking hotline. They have a lot of resources there. You inform your staff. Um, you include maybe in some of your, um, maybe you're doing an interview process in your church. Oh, that's <laughs> Cecilia. <laughs> and, um, and you can, you know, look at those things of age, of boyfriend, uh, the things that you've, you've learned. Maybe you have someone that is taking the inquiries in your church, in your church or in your ministry for the homeless. And they, some of these things is to make sure that person is trained, your front desk person is trained, that's, that's helping the public. Because actually some of those that they may be helping may be either victims of trafficking or set up for that. Okay. And this is something that we do also is, it's called the SOAR method, but um, we want to stop and understand, like we're all becoming, beginning to become aware, and that's what I, I'm wanting to do today at the conference. We want to observe, I mean, break any mindsets that we have towards who we may think is being prostituted or may come into our ministry or into our church as someone that Jesus loves, but where are our hearts? What, what, what are we seeing? Um, and then ask, and, and I do a lot of listening uh, to that person's story and just really accept them where they are unconditionally, where they are. And then um, responding through identifying needs, offering available resources to provide life-affirming support, care, healing, hope for mom and baby. I said, Lord, what can we do? We're a pregnancy center. This was down in Louisiana. And that's when he identified that 70% of the trafficking victims were pregnant. We already had the resources available. We just needed to learn, and we needed to check our hearts, and we needed to embrace and come alongside. And then that way we could learn at the same time. And I can tell you that um, I have grown closer to the Lord. I've become desperate for him because I haven't known what to do. And there have been situations that only the Lord could intervene. There was a young woman that she escaped from an abortion facility because the trafficker had taken her there. He was forcing her to have an abortion in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I live outside of New Orleans. She, through prayer, she ended up, she came down to New Orleans. She received housing through another pregnancy center, and then we all started to work together, doing one part that we could. And her baby is over a year old now. And um, she has also had to work on immigration issues because of the way that she was brought over here. But I can tell you other stories of a young woman that was being trafficked and she was being forced to have an abortion and she was pregnant with twins. Mm -hmm. And she was able to get back to her parents in the Midwest. So we can't do everything, but we can do one thing. You know, and that one thing may just be making a telephone call to the hotline. Okay. And then, um, like I said, and like these are some of the things that we do with uh, the pregnancy center and what, which many pregnancy centers do. We offer those services of unconditional <coughs> love, pregnancy test, uh, prenatal resources, adoption agency referrals, although most of the moms will want to parent their babies a community assistance network. And the other thing that we've done is we've gone in and educated law enforcement and gone into the judicial system and we have educated them as to what we do. They didn't know we were there. So it's been a wonderful opportunity to go into the secular realm and say, this is what we do. And I pretend like I act like I, I, act like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Because I haven't known. I mean, I feel like you know this is a uh, frontier. Yeah.
but we're forerunners, right? Mm, and right. Jesus hears the cry of the broken, and his cry is louder than my fear. <laughs> and his love is greater than my fear. So I want to partner with him in the places where he's going because he says that he's close to the brokenhearted. So I want to be that close. And so he, I, I want to encourage you, if there are these opportunities to go into places that you've never gone in before, go. Because they're looking for your help. Now, as far as outreaches, like we've done in the strip clubs, you really have to be called to doing that. Mm -hmm. And what I encourage you to do is, if you feel so led, find somebody that's already going. Because there probably is somebody there in your community. Partner with them. See how you can help and serve them, and you'll learn more. And the other key, main key, is intercession, intercession and prayer. Because there, the Lord may place a burden on your heart to pray for somebody. You're just sensing that burden after you've heard this. And actually, it's because there are young women that are crying out. I've had more than one, especially when I was going down to Bourbon Street, say to me, I was just crying out to Jesus tonight to send somebody to me. Mm. Or, my mom has been praying for me, and now you show up. Oh, yes. And so only Jesus you know, knows that. And I can tell you that we've had some powerful prayer meetings inside the dressing rooms of strip clubs. Mm. Because the, the, they're crying out. Who mm. would ever want to wake up and be a prostitute? Mm. And it's usually, there's a high rate of sexual abuse amongst the women, too. So these are things you can do. There's the hotline number that you can text them, and it's be free. You know, sometimes, they have grace with them, because sometimes they are busy. Or you can contact your local law enforcement and ask them if there's someone on staff or on the force that deals with human trafficking victims that you can talk to. If it's, if it's somebody that you're seeing, it's a juvenile under the age of 18, um, ask for the juvenile officer. The way the trafficking laws go, if it's an adult that's being trafficked over 18 years of age, they ha that adult that's being trafficked, it may be a little bit harder to get her help unless she wants it. If it's a minor, it's domestic minor sex trafficking, or DMST, when she's under 18 years of age, it doesn't matter if she wants help. She's going with law enforcement, and she's going to go ahead and get help because she's a minor child, and we have to report. So um, there's a need for prayer for those that are serving trafficking victims, those that are serving minor trafficking victims, and there's a real prayer, I believe, for the body of Christ to get involved and engaged in this. Mm -hmm. I believe a great harvest is coming, and the Lord wants to join the pro-life movement and the trafficking movement, they're both justice, but it's the ending of sh shedding of innocent blood and slavery mm -hmm. at the same time. And since we've been doing it, I believe, longer in unity together, we have the answer, yes. right? So, um, and then this is what we called the Love Project, and it's on healing, and it's, they, you'll hear these words, trauma-informed care, but really it is, it's about listening to the story of another person. And in their story, we learn how to respond to them, and they become an active part in their healing. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, then in, in the love, it's listening. You love unconditionally, patiently, giving way for the Lord to remove layers of trauma and lies. No expectations. <coughs> I found that down on, on Bourbon Street because I was thinking, well, I, I hope things turn out this way or that way. But the Lord said unconditionally, all I'm asking you to do is go down there and let them know by your words and your actions that I love them. And be consistent in, in what you do. Observe the person <laughs> not in the position where they are, but observe them as an overcomer beyond victim or survivor to their true identity in Christ and their true purpose in Christ not who the enemy has tried to make them or given them a stolen identity, but who the Lord has called them to be. And that's what I believe the Lord's raising up some of his last days, his greatest last days warriors, because they have faced hell and they have come out of hell. 
and that they know the cost and they will become nameless and they will become faceless they will love not their lives even unto death as, as because they've been through so much and they've seen the beauty of Jesus Christ and how he's redeemed that evil and really brought them out into a place of his intimate love I know that firsthand because that's what he's done with me <laughs> and then value speak worth get the true identity you want to hear their voice when they want to start speaking let them speak and take what is said to the Lord in prayer and not telling other people about I just heard this take that to the Lord in intercession and prayer uh, to help bring healing and freedom and embrace a new life get them involved in the church community bring them in identify and, and introduce as your friend your new friend and I've had one young woman she said I went and they identified me as a trafficking victim when they were introducing me. And so what, that just was a setup right there. And she, I never want to go back to that place again. And so we have to be careful with our words and our heart and our motives also of just stepping back and I'm a friend of Jesus and this is my, this is my new friend. I want her to see freedom in the Lord. And then declare testimony, truth, hope, and a voice not silenced. Uh, like uh, part of, of the healing process can be for some to have a Revelation 12:11 testimony of we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and we love not our lives even unto death. That they are the the voice for those that have been trafficked, and they are able to tell the body of Christ, and also are able to tell our government and law enforcement the truth. So we call that the love project and then these uh, I'm just going to go back to again uh, that helpline and the resource tab on speakhope.net because there will be additional information that you guys can go on to um, and then okay referrals uh, in your community and in your state check for anti-trafficking organizations um, get connected with them Encourage others to go ahead and get connected also. Um, you may want to make sure you have a list, especially for those that are homeless, this is what we do, of um, the food, clothing, and shelter, other emergency needs, often addiction, which requires detox, pregnancy, childbirth, uh, other legal issues. Many times the woman will have a record with law enforcement so you know connecting if you have an attorney in your um, in your church or in your ministry or community to just try and build you know maybe there's people within uh, your church that <coughs> they are interested in how can we help, how can we be aware but how can we help those that have been trafficked and how can we help those that have become pregnant and then like I said, there's the legal assistance law enforcement and uh, that uh, 888 number the poster that's on the website, the speakup.net website, the resource link. And then you got this um, brochure which we developed and some of that are actual cases in the in Louisiana. But there are a, a recap of what I've given today as far as the teaching. And then we also developed these little at-risk cards. I didn't have any available with me today, but I can give you the format for that if you want to email me. My, um, na my name is Cynthia Collins, and my email address is on uh, should be on that brochure. And it, you can also email me through speakhope.net, but you can duplicate those. And uh, we keep those available. That's one side, and on the other side it has the indicators of human trafficking. <coughs> And, there, and reaching your community, that is one of the little babies that was born. Her mom had been trafficked, mm -hmm. and uh, she's a few years older now, but um, had the honor of, actually that was the first baby that had been born. And then we went ahead and we developed these little things like chapsticks, and we put the word hope on it, and set up a Google voice number, and um, so that women could go ahead and call for help and then we were able to identify some of some women who had been trafficked 
and refer or get help through law enforcement. And then we also had little hope backpacks made up where we put um, toiletry items in there and uh, we took those and on outreach to the strip clubs and gave toiletry items, uh, the little sandals, the chapsticks, and again, just to show that uh, the women were loved. And that was building relationship and trust. Okay. In Louisiana law in 2014, there was a law that was enacted, Act 565, that required the National Human Trafficking Resource Center hotline in outpatient abortion facilities. And so, you know, there's a Louisiana law before the Supreme Court, I testified on that, the admitting privileges law. But the reason why this law came about was because we had been doing outreach and we saw, you know, they need, they need to have, uh, the abortion facilities need to have this in there and they need to be accountable for the abortions that they're doing on trafficking victims. And so they're now required by law in Louisiana to report trafficking. And then lastly, our words. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we call this ministry Speak Hope, because we want to see every person made in the image of God, in their identity in Christ, and fulfill the plan that the Lord has for them upon this earth. No matter what their past is, God has a future, and He often uses us as His hands and feet to heal. And uh, a word can give hope to the hopeless, can heal the broken, can give strength to the weak, can give breath to the breathless, and can give life to the dead. A word can change the destiny of a generation, a voice that will not be silenced. We all have a story to tell. Some need healing, strength, and direction into the path of God's plan, new life, hope, and restoration. And that's my contact information. But. Um, you have speakhub.net and there's the email address. But I can say this is that that's what happened with me is that uh, when I came to Christ I was so broken because I had multiple abortions and was at the edge, uh, very edge of being trafficked myself. It was because there were lovers of Jesus that loved me from the inside out. And um, that's what it's taking even more so is for us to draw close to the Lord and having our prayer time because there is a whole broken generation that's out there. You know, we've been fighting this battle for uh, the sanctity of human life for 47 years. Well, the enemy's plan now is stuff like this, you know, to uh, you know, kill the child in the womb, kill the soul of a woman and to sell off a whole generation. And as Brad Mattis is doing the workshop on chemical abortion, I work in a pregnancy center also, and I know chemical abortions have, have escalated. Mm -hmm. And the stories that I'm hearing mm -hmm. from the women of what has happened to them, and you can see the trauma mm -hmm. because of the lies that they were told, you know, in the abortion facility, it's still been the same. 47 years but that's why we have the answer we have Jesus you know and I believe that the Lord is using the church to heal the generation this generation mm -hmm. if we shift and stop like I did and I said Lord I have been doing this but I I sort of feel like it's routine and am I doing things by rote or am I really seeking you and saying is this where you want my heart? I, I want to be close to you, Jesus. And that's when the Lord shifted my heart in uh, to, to hearing the voices that I wasn't hearing before. So um, I want to uh, go ahead and just say a quick prayer over you, then I'm going to open it up for Q&A, okay? Because you thought that you were coming to this workshop, but the Lord sent you here. <laughs> <laughs> Father, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this beautiful time and beautiful day. And I thank you for your warriors that are here, Lord. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that it's you that speaks to our heart. You that directs our path. You that always has a divine setup to put us in the places where you want us to be. So I bless my brothers and sisters, Lord. I ask that you 
just uh, speak and embellish, Father, uh, impact the way that you want to with this information. May it go deeper and wider and longer, Father, further than what is ever expected to bring in this last day's harvest, Father mm -hmm. of the broken. And we just thank you, Father. I bless them, and I ask that you strengthen each person today, Lord. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, if you want to turn the light on, and then if you all have any Q&A, or any questions. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you for that very uh, informative presentation. I was wondering, um, what role do religious cults play human trafficking? Um, they can. And uh, I, because if there, there can be money that's, in, money that's involved in that too. Um, actually, I do not know as far as the magnitude of that, because most of it is um, that it's gangs, mafia related, and they've stopped selling drugs and they've stopped that have started selling humans. But um, because there's just more money. There's more money in it. But I know that it's being done in religious calls too, but just that's probably on the smaller end than everything else. Yeah, the other thing that I want to say is often uh, things are not what they look like. I found going down on Bourbon Street, and it just doesn't have to happen in a place where there's a lot of strip clubs. That those people that look like I could trust, I couldn't trust. Mm -hmm. Those people that I look like I, I could, and couldn't trust, I could trust. And that's why I'm so thankful that I have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Because He gives discernment. And that's where I'm saying, I mean, really draw close to the Lord because He gives discernment mm -hmm. and Will tell us something. Mm -hmm. So if he's placing that you're on about religious cults, I know with me, I had to, the Lord would tell me something, and I had to search it out. And then he would provide the answer. So, okay. Does that help? Yes, indeed, does. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, sir. There, I mean, there's, there's urgency, obviously, involved with this, but even more so, the, the life expectancy of one of these gals is about seven years. That's correct. And it's not that they just wear out and burn out. They're killed. Okay. They're killed. And there's seven years life expectancy. And, and, and the police departments do have, if they're of any size, do have a section that's, that's devoted to this. Like all police departments are overworked and understaffed. But they're there and they care passionately about these women. Mm -hmm. yeah, they really do. Uh, our gal is the head of our department. Yeah. She works herself to death for these girls. And, uh, where are where, um, Knoxville, Tennessee. Yeah. Uh, look at, there's just a lot of that going on in this it's, it's exactly what she Because Memphis is a hub. Also, that area, there's a, there's hubs that are there, and that's where the relationship and praying for the law enforcement, because they, I started in doing this part in 2009, and there was the law enforcement had to be educated, and then we all had to develop relationship with them too. So, yeah, and it's very, very, very hard for what they see. How well trained is law enforcement? Well, each state is different, and I believe that they are very well trained now, mm -hmm. and that it's that it's continual continual training. I know in uh, Louisiana, and in most states, there is a human ta uh, trafficking task force, mm -hmm. and so you can look for your state human trafficking task force and get connected with them. Uh, law enforcement ha usually has somebody there that is taking the lead on human trafficking. So when you call, call for that person. And um, and the other thing is, as I know in Louisiana, the training is continually updated. Because traffickers have been doing this for a long time. Right? And so, uh, you know, there, there's, there's continual training that's going on too. And that's why I want to encourage you, is that this is just the beginning of information 
you can go ahead and look mm -hmm. online and get in contact with anti-trafficking organizations close to where you live. Your, your point about switching from drugs to girls, if, if a guy sells drugs, he sells it, it's gone, he's got to buy some more. But he can use the girl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never, never, never. never. Yeah. Yeah. Until she's completely that. lost her identity as a human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And Teresa Flores, the gal who wrote the book, um, Prisoner, and I don't know. A prisoner Next Door. Yeah, pri prisoner Next Door. Prisoner Next Door. Yeah, yeah. It, I recommend that. Okay. It will open your eyes. Yeah, pri Prisoner Next Door is a, is a great book by Teresa Flores, and I think you can get that on the Amazon. And it will really, just reading it, it gives you a personal story, but it also gives you the indicators of what to go ahead and look for. Yes, have, do you know if the clinics are reporting it now that it's a law? Like, have you seen any any indication of that? Because I do a lot of sidewalk counseling, and, and being a nurse, I'm kind of flagged to picking up these signs. Right. And so what I'm seeing is a lot of going into the clinics look like. Where do you live? Well, I'm in North Carolina now, but we saw a lot of it in Pittsburgh, which right. I don't think is good. No. I know down south where we're at, yeah. Well, and I'm originally from Pennsylvania, so um, I, this is what I do know. I do know that the women that I've been serving that have gone into the abortion facilities uh, for abortions have told me that they are being asked more rigorous questions by the um, abortion staff. If uh, the young woman tells there's a disparity in the age or you know, different things mm -hmm. that was not going on before. Uh, that they're reporting, I don't know. <coughs> uh, but I know that we're trying to do, we do as much as we can do, all of us do as much as we can do. Get involved in your legislature. Uh, and there's actually legislation that we can connect you with, Bioethics Defense Fund, Dorinda Bordley, that drafted that legislation that can be used in any state. You know, make the abortion facilities go ahead and put the signage in there. Mm -hmm. And um, in some states, I'm not sure if we're doing this, but we're requiring training of the abortion staff on human trafficking. So, um, and what what happened was one of the administrative staff of one of the abortion facilities said in New Orleans, when we started testifying and talking about this piece of legislation, you could see her go like this because she was recounting how many women she had seen because she said I think that we have seen some women. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> yes ma'am? I, um, I know so little. Um, That's a good place. <laughs> but I understand that I-81 is in western Virginia, western part of Virginia, mm -hmm. is a heavy, heavily trafficked place. And the other thing I was going to say is I was out uh, prayer walking with a group of us in, in Baltimore in a very poor section. And uh, we were talking to a grandmother sitting on the porch and her granddaughter goes out to us uh, to invite uh, contact. And there was a man in the car and this man occurred to me. Uh, the pastor we were walking with just took a picture of the car with the license plate. Mm -hmm. So simple, and the guy goes drove off without the girl. And it didn't do a huge thing, but it was a small thing. It's a small, a small, the small things really count. Robin, ten minutes left. Ten minutes? Okay, good. Um, and that's 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 the thing is that we can each do a small thing. You know, we can make a telephone call. We can contact. Uh, you know, law enforcement or anti-trafficking organizations, we can all pray. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, that's a good thing. And the, that's the thing is that they are trafficking in these out, out communities, outside communities, outlying communities. And uh, like New Orleans is maybe 20, 25 miles away from me, but there's a little town called Bogalusa and other towns that are outside. And, um, that's where the girls are being taken. Mm -hmm. They're being they're being taken from there and even to there mm -hmm. uh, because they, the traffickers think nobody's going to suspect mm -hmm. a brothel, you know, in that place. So I just go back to prayer. 
So, in, yes, sir. I'm also in the Pittsburgh area now. The um, Shell Oil is building a fracking plant under where we are. So they have brought in about 5,000 men who are building this plant. And the FBI has said that the core oh, between wow, Pittsburgh yeah. and the plant is just mm -hmm. is one of the heaviest uh, human trafficking mm -hmm. orders right now. <clears throat> we run into a couple of women. I'm just wondering if you find that there are people who are starting ministries. These these were women that were trafficked. They got out and they're. They know what to look for, and are actually rescuing women who are in there. They basically try to get them about two hours away to a uh, safe house, basically that they that they purchased to get them away from the, uh, mm -hmm. the people that are trafficking. But you see, you find more and more uh, many non-law enforcement people getting involved in helping to. Yeah, there would be NGOs. Okay. And actually, just partnering with law enforcement, and each doing their part. And, and working together because somebody who's overcome trafficking, like somebody who's overcome abortion, and, and most of the women are Christians, they are a powerful weapon mm -hmm. because they know what to look for and the young women will trust them and know how to speak the language. Mm -hmm. And they also know how to bring about healing too. So it's important, like we were talking about, Teresa Flores is in Ohio, but um, there that would be another prayer point to pray for women as they're being healed from the trauma of trafficking, just like we've been praying for women that have been healed from the trauma of abortion, to begin to speak out. Uh, Dr. Marlon Carson um, is in Ohio also. She was both trafficked and then used as a manager of the girls. And there's Dr. Brooke Bella, who's based down in Florida. She has a whole area there. Uh, Brooke was trafficked when she was very young and she's had to have a hysterectomy, not being able to have children. But she does a lot of healing with the young women. So, so that would be a prayer because there's there uh, are not enough places. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah. what part of Pittsburgh? Well, I'm at now Aquipa. Okay. And the uh, fracking plant is in Shipping Port, which is just a bit, we're about half an hour northwest yeah. of Pittsburgh, along yeah. the Ohio River. I'm from Monongahela. Okay. <laughs> the Mon Valley. The Mon Valley. You know, and that's where you look at places where there's been devastation. Like in New Orleans, we had Hurricane Katrina, a lot of destruction. And so traffickers look at that as maybe an opportunity to go ahead and take the girls. Mm -hmm. And then if there's um, economic problems, there can be the same thing of taking young women from there. Or if there's crews coming in, like with fracking, well then the traffickers or the trafficking when you see that as profit. Mm -hmm. That's the supply and demand side. Well, just one other thing, it, it, it's not just girls. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, Young boys. Yeah. 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 Young boys too. We're, we're concentrating on the girls. Oh, and I, I, did, yeah. I didn't mean to detract from that, but, mm -hmm. but it, it's uh, not a respect for the Right, no respect for gender, and that's where, like, runaways. Um, down at the edge of the French Quarter, there's Baptist Friendship House, and they see a lot of um, young girls and young boys. You know, down there, too. So. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, what's the role of clergy and the church in, in this? The, the town that I come from is Front Royal, Virginia. Uh, there's three massage parlors in that that town, um, and they're open for business and they're they're open all the time. Um, and I, I was talking to uh, an FBI agent who was telling me that you know they don't they're not going to go to the police, the local police, but do they go to clergy? And and what do we do if they come through our door, or we know someone who maybe is in danger? Or we see that they're in danger. Well. They, and do you have a, a good? Re, do you have a relationship with law enforcement already? Well, I'm in seminary now, so uh, that, that's okay. all well, I do. But when I come back for the summer, um, I, I, how can law? I mean, law enforcement must know about it because they do. everybody in town knows about it. But they're still open for business. So, well, what they what have do to do is to? because we we had that in my town, and what law enforcement did was they. There has to be a law that they're breaking. 
That's what they have to do because mm. I can know something's bad, but there has to be a law that they're breaking. And so they found a law that they were breaking, and one of those was that they had brought girls in from China mm. and um, that they didn't have proper identification. And I, don't, I can't remember. The, and, and the other thing is, is that the girls were, there was an undercover sting, and the girls were doing something that it was not a massage. And then the other thing is, is what are the requirements to have a license for massage in that state? And because that massage, that's not a massage, you know, yeah. it's a massage therapist. So you think about that is, if law enforcement is not enforcing that law, they're wrong. So what are the laws on, on uh, massage parlors in, in your community? And uh, again, you know, I go back to prayer and then developing a relationship with somebody in law enforcement that you can talk to about that too. So we were able to get the um, the massage parlors uh, thrown out of our community wow. because there was a law. Good job. Mm -hmm. There was a law, and you can go to state legislature also, or you know talk to it, talk to the local legislator, your local local legislator, tell them of your concern. There may already be a law in the books that's not being enforced. What do you do if you suspect some, somebody being trafficking? I mean, I was having my hair cut, and the next to me was a another hairstylist, and a girl came in with an older gentleman, and he was very over it, more so than I would have thought somebody dropped off their daughter to have a haircut. And she, he pretty much told him how to cut her hair and everything like that, which made me suspect that she wasn't there by herself or this wasn't her fault. So in a case like that, by the time I would go leave and call somebody, they would be gone. Right. So what do you do? Well, what you can do is, um, if that's a regular hair salon that you go to, do some education with the salon staff. Because they're probably seeing other people when you're not there. Mm -hmm. And so you do that, because this can be very, oh, I missed it. You know, so I think right. this hair cutter knew these people, mm -hmm. but yeah. will they ever admit that? I mean, well, they may know. not. Just it all, all depends on where where's that person's moral compass, mm -hmm. you know, because it's it's greed also. But you can be getting paid. You can give them information. You can copy this thing and and give it to them. Um, they may not know what to do. They may think it's all right. They may mm -hmm. think these girls are toys. They're being they're, they're prostituting on their own. And that they're doing this out of their own free will. They may, they may or may not know. And you can still report it and have the police keep an eye right. on the place. And, mm -hmm. I mean, they're probably, she said, bringing more girls back there. Yeah. You can still report it to police, tell them of your concern. And But try and talk to somebody that is familiar with trafficking in the police department. Go beyond the dispatcher. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and maybe have a sit down with them. Does that help? Yeah. And have courage. Well, well, you just don't know what to do in a public situation no, like yeah. that. That you, you know, next time I take a picture. <laughs> well, I've even been like in the Seven Eleven. You know, like you're traveling and you're at the Love's trucks, and and somebody comes in and you're like, something's just that that gut yeah. feeling, that that woman yeah. feeling that something's not right about this relationship. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just being able to slip them a, like I would carry cars, so you could slip them a car. Mm -hmm. Or one of the one of the rest stops coming here yesterday had the poster up. If you're being in the women's bathroom, if you're being trafficked, here's where to call for help. They're up in the, they're up in the uh, rest stops. Also, mm -hmm. many of the rest stops have the posters up. The problem, as you said, is that they're they're, most of them are afraid to to do anything unless they're really encouraged because. It's going to cost them. It's going to cost them. It's going to cost them. It's going to Sometimes even with them being found with a card with another one. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They'll yeah. get beat. But, you know, if you do, I've learned that, okay, I see it, and I, I may have not been able to help, but if I can go back and educate the hair salon, I've gone back to like nail salons, done education there also, and I've done I've done something, and and reported to law enforcement, 
to do, you know, to go ahead and do what you can. And we did make some little business cards with the human trafficking hotline number on it. I've always, I don't have any with me today, but I've kept it some in my purse.